Hi, I'm Melissa. And I'm Candace. Welcome back to The Build Up, presented by Brown Harris Stevens, where we discuss the secrets of building wealth through real estate. Today, we're going to be discussing the state of the retail market, as well as speaking with a major league soccer legend, now turned real estate investor, Aleko Eskadarian. Speaking of the retail market, Prada recently agreed to purchase their Fifth Avenue uh, building here in New York City, as well as the building next door for $800 million. And Gucci is also paying nearly a billion dollars for a 115 square foot building uh, just a few blocks away. Wow, a billion dollars. That's a pretty big price tag. But again, they're not the only ones. Uh, LVMH is also in talks to purchase a building on Fifth Avenue, the building where currently Bergdorf Goodman's men's store is. That's right. So I'm wondering, what is this recent surge, right, that all of these retailers are trying to buy out their landlords? Yeah, it's not just here in New York City. It's also happening a lot in Europe, in places like Paris and London. There's a lot of retailers who are purchasing the real estate in these popular locations. That's interesting. Is it because of the high rent prices? I have to assume, especially in these prime locations, that rents are really high. Of course. I mean, again, going back to Fifth Avenue as a marker, the rents there for retail spaces are over $2,000 per square foot on average. Also, if they're facing a renewal, then they get hit with very significant lease renewal prices as well. And these retailers, they don't want to give up that location because it's very prime and they know that they're going to be there for years to come. So it just makes sense that they would look at it to purchase rather than keep renting at these high prices. A hundred percent. And even though, you know, we've the retail market has really struggled a lot since COVID, a lot of people also did make money during that same period, and especially in the luxury sector. So we have seen growth in the sales of luxury goods. LVMH actually reported that they had ninety four billion in sales last year, which was higher than the analysts forecasted. Seeing these positive reports on sales, they're now feeling more in a position to actually make these moves and purchase instead of continuing to rent, which is the same thing that we preach on the residential side, you know, you mentioned that they want to stay in these locations for many years to come, their prime locations. So if you know that, same thing when you're thinking about if you should buy versus rent your home, if you know you're going to be in that location for a long time, it most likely makes more sense to actually purchase than just continuing wasting money on rent. And that's not very surprising at all, because in 23, JP Morgan, they predicted that 24 is going to be a great year for the retail market. And even though e-commerce continues to grow, it's only 15% of the retail market. So there's plenty of room for brick and mortar operators, especially in the luxury space, as well as uh, B and C class malls. So there's plenty of demand there. Wow. I mean, I'm surprised that e-commerce only represents 15% of the retail market. I mean, I feel like I personally buy everything online, but that's good to know that there's still a lot of room for growth. Yeah, of course. As you know, we all love convenience, right? Think about Amazon dominating in that space where we, you know, we just a click of a button, you have something delivered even same day, right? But uh, think about the luxury space. For me personally, if I'm investing $5,000, I want to just really have a feel of that quality of that bag or that outfit. I want to try it on and we have the full experience. For sure. And that's what a lot of retail stores are moving into. What we're seeing post-COVID is more of experience in their store to get people to come in, have a, something that they couldn't have online. And so overall, it's really great to see the retail operators getting into the real estate market by being becoming owners and not just tenants. So now their business is not only you know reliant on the sales of their goods, but now they have an underlying real estate investment component to it. And we see that a lot with different types of businesses like storage facilities, self-storage. It's really more of a real estate play if they own those buildings. They use the storage as a way to kind of operate it and have some cash flow from it. But the real value of those storage businesses often is the real estate that they own. So it's yeah. a similar concept with what retail seems to be doing right now. Exactly. And I mean, think of it of all the tax you know, benefits. Think of when you own a property, how many other benefits there are. We're not going to get into that today, but it just makes sense overall. If you have the cash, why not invest it in real estate? For sure. It's nice to see some positive news and some positive deals happening in the retail market because like we said, it suffered so much in the past few years after COVID, but it seems like it's uh, moving in the right direction. Exactly. Today we welcome, for any of our soccer fans, a major league soccer legend who is both an MLS Cup MVP <laughs> and an MLS All-Star who post his successful athlete career is now the VP of Player Relations and Player Development for none other than the MLS. Aleko, welcome to The Build-Up. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, it was not done intentionally, but a lot of our guests so far have been immigrants and first generation. And for you, Aleko, you are first generation with your parents emigrated from Iran. And we know you've been very vocal about your, you know, your experience here um, as first generation. So what do you think that, you know, how did that really impact you to really find your passion for soccer? Yeah, um, that's a heavy first question yes. for sure, um, but one that I'm really passionate about. So mm -hmm. my uh, family, our ethnicity is Armenian, actually, and the circumstances that led mm -hmm. to my parents growing up in Iran are actually pretty mm -hmm. uh, tragic, where there's a genocide mm -hmm. uh, right before uh, the First World War, uh, where um, there was essentially an ethnic cleansing of Christian Armenians. Mm -hmm. So millions of Armenians were killed and millions of others had to flee. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the family story with how, you know, my both my parents are Christian Armenians who grew up in Iran because there was a pocket of Armenians in, in Tehran. Um, and, yeah, my, my dad's story is unbelievable. Like there should be a movie made about mm -hmm. it because he kind of rose through adversity and, and discrimination and, and became a, a national hero in Iran as one of the top soccer players, played in the World Cup in 1978, awesome. and then emigrated uh, to the U.S., to New York. Um, and my brother and I were both born here. So um, growing up, was always very cognizant and aware of my family story, how we arrived to America, uh, some that I always carried with me. And inevitably, growing up, when people would hear my name, they'd be like, okay, what? I've never heard that name. What kind of name is that? So I got pretty used to explaining our family story and our, our origins. And I went to an Armenian school growing up. I didn't go to a regular public school or, or whatever it was. Um, I went to an Armenian school in Jersey, um, eight kids in my grade. So like very small school, but we learned, you know, the history of our culture, our traditions. And uh, it's something that I'm very proud of. And and something that I, I enjoy talking about and just educating others about because without, you know, once your story gets lost, your your history, your customs get lost. So we're all very proud and, and try to, to carry that with us. That's amazing. Also, you probably don't know this, but my ethnicity is half Armenian. Oh my gosh, amazing. Yeah, my mom was born in Lebanon and obviously her, you know, grandparents had also emigrated and went during that genocide all over that part of the world. So she was born in Lebanon and then she came to the U.S. when she was 16. So oh. also Armenian. Um, I'm in good company. Then, right? Yes. He's like, OK, the interview yes. can continue. <laughs> Trust you guys. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's awesome. And we really value that. You know, Melissa's an immigrant. And like I said, you know, my mom came here from Lebanon. So we really relate. And, um, you know, you were brought into the world of soccer, it sounds like, from your dad. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's had a successful career, it sounds like. And overall, soccer is the biggest global sport with over three and a half billion fans. Right. So, um, you know, that made your feat of being the number one draft pick into the MLS a pretty outstanding accomplishment. What did that mean for you and your family? Probably vindication in some ways, because growing up, it was a little bit difficult in that everyone's always like, you know, you're the, the pro soccer player's kid. Right. So I kind of had a, a target on my back. Um, and I, I felt like I would hear the whispers about like, oh, he's not that good. It's just because he's so-and-so's kid and things like that. And I saw my older brother go through it as well. So um, he probably took a few bullets for me. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons from from watching his path. Um, but yeah, I, I always just had a chip on my shoulder as a kid. Like it, I was so competitive to the point that I was not fun to play any. Oh, no. right? Because it was I just wanted to win so bad. Uh, no matter what I did, but I had a really strong work ethic, discipline. Um, and there were a bunch of, you know, peaks and valleys as well. Like I got, you know, cut from a state team at 14 years old. And then two years later, I'm on the national team. Right. So it's like you kind of experience that disappointment um, and that adversity and it builds character. And I'm really fortunate that my, you know, my family, my, my parents were a really strong support group for me. But um, yeah, Finally, breaking through national team, playing at UVA, which was, you know, the number one uh, college soccer team in the country at the time and leaving school early to be the number one pick was was a dream come true. It was just kind of like for a while I dreamt of it, but I wouldn't imagine that that would come true. So for it to, to actually happen was was a blessing. 
That's amazing. And, you know, people always see the end product, but they don't always see the come up. And that for us is really important because we have a similar, you know, journey in real estate where, you know, we're really proud of our success now. But, you know, a lot of people don't know the sacrifice it takes to get there. And so it's well, that's what we're always really interested to talk more about with any of our guests, you know, who have achieved success to kind of hear their story and the sacrifices they made and that it's not always just, you know, a linear trajectory to success. It's a lot of ups and downs. And so um, that's so you know, so impressive that you, you got there and that, you know, you, you found your career. Um, but we rattled off so many achievements that you've had in soccer. What do you feel is your most proud accomplishment as a professional athlete? That's a, that's another tough one. I feel like I get asked that a lot and I feel like I've had different <laughs> answers. In that's the okay. past. Um, but yeah, there are so many, right? Because, um, you have to kind of go back into the moment and what it propels you to, right? Because there are certain things that you, again, dream about, but you, you're not so sure you could actually achieve it. Um, so obviously winning MLS Cup and stepping up for for my team in the biggest game of the season was was a huge accomplishment. I think just elevated me to another level of what you know my standards were for myself. Um, I scored a goal against Real Madrid, which was the top team in the world at that time. Uh, against Beckham and Raul, Roberto Carlos, Casillas, like all these guys that were, you know, I had posters of them on my wall. So to be on the field with them was surreal. And then score a goal in the game in front of, um, I think it was like 72,000 people in Seattle or something wow. like that. Uh, again, another kind of dream come true. I was like, all right, put that on my tombstone. <laughs> um, but for me, it's, you know, as I get older, it's the off the field stuff, you know, to continue my education uh, finished my degree at UVA. That was something I was really proud of because there's so many professional athletes that leave school early that, you know, find it tough to kind of have that discipline to, to stay the course, but uh, kept the promise to my mom that I would graduate. And so I'm, I'm really proud of taking classes, online classes, uh, remote classes, kind of chipping away at it. Uh, and then finally graduating from UVA was, was another dream come true. I love that. And overall here in the U.S., soccer is growing, which is very exciting. It hasn't always been, you know, one of our top sports. You know, football seems to be the most popular at the moment. The other football. <laughs> but <laughs> yes. but um, a lot of money and effort is going behind pushing it yeah. as, a, as a sport in the U.S. And actually the next World Cup, as you know, is coming to the U.S. at Medlife Stadium in New Jersey, your home state. And so what does that mean for you to see it growing in the U.S.? It's massive. Um you know, even when I was in the middle of my playing career, we used to joke around about, oh, we're going to be on like, you know, MLS films one day talking about back in our day, you know, we, we barely got paid and so and so. Uh, but to see how rapidly it's grown has, has really been amazing. And from now, for me to now be a part of that, uh, working at MLS and helping to develop our league and specifically our, our young domestic players um, focusing on their player pathway, it's amazing to see how much opportunity is out there and to see people fall in love with the sport that, you know, has always been a part of my life and, and, and my family. Um, but to see like a generic sports fan and be like, Oh, this is actually a pretty cool sport that I could get behind has been amazing. And, you know, tons of credit to a lot of different people and entities because um, it's not easy to, to break through, right? You have the, the, the four major sports here that have been around for a very long time um, so there's a lot of work for, for soccer to do to break through, but, um, yeah, ultimately I, I think it's, it's, uh, the world's game. It's the beautiful game and, and, um, it's great to see American culture kind of getting behind it. For sure. It is indeed. Um, I think, do you think that Netflix had anything to do with it? I mean, I'm an avid F1 fan, right? And I think, um, three years ago, you know, America didn't even know about F1 that right. much, right? And now Absolutely. it's a household name. And I think there was a documentary on Netflix as well. Do you think that that played a part of this really rapid growth that we're seeing? I think it's a couple of things. Um, and I actually wrote my college thesis on oh, it. Okay. So I, I have it fresh in my mind, <laughs> not too fresh. But um, yeah, I think, you know, mixing into pop culture is huge, mm -hmm. right? So first thing was the video game mm. FIFA mm -hmm. on PlayStation right. or whatever it was. That was the first time that my buddies who hated soccer had zero interest in soccer mm -hmm. would be like, Oh, you, you want to play FIFA? And I'm like, yeah. what do you know about FIFA? <laughs> and they're like naming names of players and things like that. And I'm like, Oh wow. I'm seeing people who had no interest who now, because they like the game are like learning about teams and, and star players and all that stuff. So I think that was the first thing. Um, Exposure on, on TV is huge, mm -hmm. right? Um, getting 
Netflix shows or documentaries, you know, even um, uh, documentaries of past players with Pelé, Maradona, mm -hmm. some of the legends of the game. There have been some incredible documentaries made. Um, ESPN had a great 30 for 30 about mm -hmm. the two Escobars with Pablo Escobar and Andres mm -hmm. Escobar, the Colombian player who, who was killed uh, after a World Cup game. So things like that, I think, make you know people who weren't paying attention be like, this is cool. But I think most importantly is guys like a Cristiano Ronaldo mm -hmm. who are in the limelight, who are, you know, in the tabloids, in magazines, fashion, whatever right. it is, you know, that spurs interest. And mm -hmm. if you're a kid, you see that, you see the glitz and the glamour, you're like, I, how did that person, you know, attain that? Mm -hmm. um, and they get interested in the pathway. So I think a combination of all those things um, play a huge part. And uh, yeah, it's in, F one's a great example. I, I knew nothing about <laughs> F1 and then all of a sudden I'm hearing like every person talk about it. So I'm like, all right, let's check this out. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think to the, the new generation, the next generation, they're the ones who are really pushing it as well. My son, he's 13 and he just talks about soccer all the time. And now I'm being forced to watch these documentaries <laughs> with him. So yeah, I'm a little now knowledgeable on it. But um, switching gears a little bit, as you know, a career as a pro professional athlete can be very brief. So for this reason, and it's incredibly important for athletes to really leverage their platforms to build wealth outside of the field, right? So what led you to consider real estate as a form of investment? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, for me, my career ended, ended abruptly as well. I had a career ending injury at 27 mm -hmm. in the prime of my career. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, snap of a finger and you're like, oh, wow, what, mm -hmm. what do I do now? Like my employment is gone right. and who am I, right? It's tough to even look in the mirror because you're like, my identity has just been taken away. Um, but again, luckily, uh, fall back on my education, my family, my support system, and you got to get back on the horse and try to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, finding stability in my life was, was a huge thing. So again, finding my next occupation, um, and when it came to real estate and, and buying my apartment in the city, you know, it was a couple of things because for one, um, it's an investment, right? And, you know, rent in the city is, is crazy. So you just do the simple math and you're like, all right, this much paying in rent, I have some money put away. This just makes a whole lot more sense, uh, locking at a good rate and, and pay a mortgage. Um, but it was just kind of investing in the, in the part of the city that I love the most, that I was spending the most time. Um, oh, what's that? West Village. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in a bubble. Yeah. I'm in a bubble. Yes. And I've been in New York for 11 years now, all 11 years in West Village. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely venture out. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, it was also planning routes, right? Because during my career, I was always on the move, always had a backpack. You never know when you're going to get traded. You have road trips. So I felt like I was living life out of a bag for, you know, call it 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and so finally to kind of say, you know what, this is going to be home. I'm going to buy a place. It was just like a next chapter in my life. And, and something I'm really proud of. That's, that's so, great. yeah, that's so good to hear. And I'm sure that going into purchasing your first property, you know, there was some uncertainties and fears that you may have had for most people. It's the single biggest investment that they'll ever make. And so there's some really natural, you know, um, fears that you would have going into it. What were some of yours and how did you overcome them? Yeah. The unknown, you know, for me as an athlete, it's always been about like preparation and, and, you know, kind of knowing the end result before you even step on the field, right. Because of the work that you put in and real estate's just a whole different beast because I feel like I'd get 10 different answers from different, 10 different people, depending on, you know, what I was asking. Um, and so, yeah, just trying to do my research, be diligent, uh, be patient. I, I think I was apartment hunting for, probably a good year and a half before I finally settled and, and bought my place um, and going through the ups and downs of like, Oh, all right, I found the perfect place, putting in an offer and getting outbid. And you're like, what? It's, it's like, very emotional. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's and, an emotional and process. It's defeating. Yeah. Cause you're like, oh, I don't, I, you know, I, that was the place. What am I going to mm -hmm. do now? Um, but yeah, it, it became a little bit of a game too, which I, which I appreciated and enjoyed. Um, and just seeing my friends, family kind of go through their own journey uh, I knew it was something I want to do and that I want to continue to do. So like even now I still have eyes on different things and, uh -oh. you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just asking people around all the time. If you see something good, some pops up, let me know. Um, Cause yeah, I, I would, you know, like everyone else, I'm sure I've watched all like the, you know, flip it shows mm -hmm. and all that. Um, so that is something that is appealing, but 
uh, there is that little trepidation where you're like, oh, all right, am I biting off more than I can chew? But it is it is exciting for sure. Yeah, flipping is a tough one. We actually had another guest on who has had a lot of success flipping in this area, but it's right. really, really tough to you know make the numbers work and it's such a slim margin. I want to flip in this area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you start in a market where you have a little more margin for error and get to like, right. yeah, understand it better. But um, now that you've gone through the process of purchasing a property, what transferable skills do you see between being an athlete and being an investor. I mean, you mentioned a little bit that there's some gamesmanship, but what else do you think, you know, helped you to be a good investor? Yeah, patience. I think patience, discipline for sure. Um, because it's, like I said, it's emotional. It's easy to kind of make an irrational decision, but um, saying the course and understanding like, all right, you have to kind of play the game, wait your turn um, and feel good about it. And I, I think even for my place, it was like, you know, again, almost like this bidding war type of thing. And then uh, I got some great advice, which was like, look, you can't pinch pennies over a few thousand here and there. If you feel good about something like pay what, whatever it is and, and, and move on with it. Right. Especially because it's a long term investment. It's not like you're going to flip it. So. Correct. correct. Mm -hmm. But it's, you're almost like playing this game of chicken a little bit of like, oh, like, you know, the listing price versus, you know, <laughs> who else is involved and all that stuff. But um, ultimately I think it was like, all right, I feel really good about this place. I love this place. I pulled the trigger and, you know, I'm really grateful I did, at the, especially at the time that I did, because I think it's appreciated, um, in a nice way. And, uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't ever want to give it up. I and think you got the low rate you mentioned. I got the yes. low rate, which, which is great. But, uh, yeah, I think this one's like sentimental. I'm like, I want to keep this forever. Right? You should. And, yeah. yeah. You can rent it out and use your equity and flip into something exactly. else. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, especially in West Village too, which has been nice because, you know, hopefully the community keeps growing the way it has and, and I don't see it uh, depreciating anytime soon. We what's, don't either. What's your favorite thing about the West Village? <laughs> All of it. Um, <laughs> I'm a big foodie, so I love the restaurants. I love being able to walk uh, to restaurants. I'm not, I don't cook much, if at all. Um, so it's great to have access to a lot of different places to eat. But I have the West Side Highway to run, get my workout in. Um, I have a straight shot home to Jersey to go see my my uh, family. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it just has a little bit of everything, but it's the people. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, I think everyone that lives in West Village has a sense of pride, tries to keep the, the neighborhood clean, classy. And, um, yeah, even the establishments that come in, I mm -hmm. think, uh, all bring a, a good vibe. Yeah. Definitely. We loved West Village. We go there a lot, too. Um, but as someone who has experienced the highs and lows of the professional sport, um, you mentioned, you know, things can end really quickly and you're left, you know, just wondering what's next. Right. So what advice would you give young athletes um, in thinking about their financial future and how do they plan for that, especially with real estate? Yeah, I think financial stability is key. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in some ways I got lucky when my career ended. You know, I couldn't imagine if I had a wife and kids already and now all of a sudden, you know, you lose your your form of employment, it could be pretty difficult. And if you don't have money saved away, if you don't have uh, other uh, streams of income coming in to subsidize, it's going to be tough. And now you might have to make decisions that aren't necessarily what you want that are going to bring you happiness, but are just necessity to put food on the table. Right. So I think um, being educated and just like, throughout your journey, whether you're making 50 grand a year, 500 grand a year, whatever it is, of just understanding how much to, to put away, what your goals are for the long term. Because, um, yeah, playing a sport is, there's an expiration date for everybody, right? No one, no one can overcome that. Um, but even in other professions as well, like you never know when things can happen and things change. Life throws curveballs at you. So I just think it's important to be diligent have some money set aside, have some investments on the side um, and have a life on the side, right? When you become too invested in just being one thing and, and having your identity so intertwined with one thing, it limits you as a person. So I think those things just, just help provide balance. Great. What helped you to feel like you had some sense of financial literacy and understanding how to build your wealth off the field? Like what tools or resources put you in that position? It was a process. Um, I don't think I, I understood it early on. I think I was just kind of uh, wore my heart on my sleeve, played the sport that I love. I was living a dream. I didn't think too much about, you know, a brand off the field or anything like that. Um, but I think as, you know, you started 
getting through and get sponsorship offers and get asked to go to certain events and start asking questions, you're like, oh, okay, like this is, you know, nice to get, you know, 5K here, 10K there. You're like, oh, okay, like this could be something that can be lucrative. Um, And so, yeah, you start just thinking about, you know, how you want to um, grow your brand, how you want to, uh, you know, grow to be the person you want to be while activating um, for like-minded sponsors, brands, or even ventures, right? That sounds so tough though. Cause like you said, when you're playing at that level, it's so all encompassing and you feel like, you know, you have to really give every ounce of yourself to you playing know. at that level. So how do you then have the bandwidth to think about, you know, your future beyond it? And also, cause the minute you take your focus off, you know, that's when you can slip as a, as an athlete. So how is it possible now that you've gone through it and like, what advice would you give to other athletes? Like, okay, yeah, like keep your focus a hundred percent in and and also, what can they do to work in some some steps to build their success after their career? And yeah. do you think also, too, that the sport can have some resources for young athletes coming in? Absolutely. Well, first of all, all of it needs to be complementary, right? Mm-hmm. If it is taking away from your focus or from the work, from your day job, from what is your primary focus, then it could be a problem. And many, many athletes fall into that trap, right? They become in love with the off the field Mm -hmm. activities or um, again, the glamor that it comes with. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, the whole reason I got into this position in the first place, I'm now neglecting a little bit. With that said, balance is important too. folks that, and it's not for everyone. Every every person's different. And that's, that's actually really important as well. There are some people like myself. I love being social, being out and about, you know, mixing it up with people. If not, I'd be bored at home. Like I, I, there's no way I, I could, just sit around and, and do nothing. So um, as long as I'm using my energy for something that's benefiting me in the long run, then great. For some other people, they're not they're not cut for that, right? And it's actually better for them to kind of- Stay be, at home. Yeah, <laughs> stay at home, be introverted. Um, but I think those people can find other avenues to do it. Like you don't have to necessarily be- you know, put your, be putting yourself out there just to, to make money. You can passively invest. Exactly. Yeah. There's, mm-hmm. there's plenty of other ways uh, to do it as well. But- You have to find a balance that works for you. Um, And as far as the sport, yeah, like especially being at MLS now, very aware of all all the corporate sponsors, all the activations that are going on, the grassroots. That's something that as a as an athlete, if you're a professional athlete, it's really important to integrate Mm -hmm. yourself with because now, you know, like, okay, now we have synergy here. Oh, you sponsor MLS and I'm an MLS player. Maybe there's something that we could activate here. Um, There's plenty of agents as well who. Um, help facilitate that, who that's their job to essentially find those brands that align with, with the values of the player and uh, try to find, you know, opportunities for, for them to grow. And again, find wealth that lo- lasts much longer uh, mm-hmm. than a playing career. That's really all and very insightful and something that we talk a lot about because we see a real need for more financial literacy, especially as it relates to real estate, because real estate is one of the biggest wealth generators, you know, generationally that there has been. So it's really important to us. And really the purpose behind this whole podcast is helping people to feel more empowered to make those important decisions and by learning and hearing from people like yourself who went through it, who aren't necessarily in real estate and how they were able to, you know, navigate that process. But, you know, we'll leave you with one last question it's probably a tough one but (laughs) that's what we're here for which is what do you hope is your lasting legacy on your industry that's a tough one um because it shifts um as a player it was obviously you know you want to be remembered for how you played the game and you know uh always gave it everything you had and found success um but even as a player it was always important for me that my love for the game showed and that it helped inspire, you know, someone else to, to also share that same passion. Um, and it's not too different now in, in my current role where it's just trying to make the ecosystem better, um, and just leaving it in a better place than, than I found it. I went through my own journey, you know, coming through the ranks in Jersey on my pathway to be a pro. And I'm proud to say that with the work that we've done, it's so much easier and more lucrative for, a uh, young American soccer player today to make it. Um, there's way more opportunity. There's way more investment. Um, there's way more um, effort being put in to do it the right way. 
And um, yeah, I think for me, it's it's just making it a, a better landscape than, than what it was when, when I came through and um, helping kids reach their dreams. And it's, to me, so rewarding when I get a player who is, you know, grinding on the come up um, and through, you know, meeting me or, or eventually getting a contract uh, is like, man, you, you know the grind that I was going through to get here. And, and now all of a sudden we... They play in MLS, they get sold. They're in Europe now playing in Champions League matches. It's uh, it's amazing. And not that I'm like living vicariously through them, but it's more about this is this is the opportunity that every kid dreamt of when, when I was a kid that didn't seem possible. And now it is, which is which is a huge, uh, huge credit to everyone in the industry that's been working on it. Yeah, dreams are powerful for sure. And so that's where it all starts. And the fact that you're facilitating people's dreams is really, really inspirational. And and hopefully they'll also take some notes from your book on how you've also built your wealth outside of the sport. And so we're all going to be really excited for soccer and the <laughs> years to come and watch it grow like F1 has. And, um, and thank you so much for being a part of this conversation today. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for all that you guys are doing. So really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aleko, for joining us today. It was so great hearing his unique perspective on sports, real estate investing, and of course, the future of soccer in the U.S. Absolutely. It was really an insightful conversation and really great to see his passion in not just real estate and sports, but also really advocating for young athletes. Today's episode was presented by Brown Hair Stevens. And as always, you can find us at tower.com and on our social media platforms at tower. See you next time.